Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. This is Esther Schindler. I want to welcome you to our webinar on Is Agile Code Review an Oxymoron? Um, if you want to participate in, on Twitter, we are going to use the hashtag of Agile Code Review, all as one word, because we don't want to run into other strange things like World of Warcraft discussions or other alternatives. Uh, as I said, I'm Esther Schindler, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief and Editorial Director of Software Quality Connection, um, and I've been a geek for software uh, uh, anything to do with software development for a long time. I'm really glad to have these folks here talking uh, about Agile and Code Review, which are areas that are both close to my heart. I'm going to let them do their own interview uh, introductions, and then what we're going to do is go into a Q&A format. The way that I described it is this is the uh, conference you have after the conference in the bar with the smart people after two or three beers when you're saying what you really think. So that's how we're running it. Um, take it away, Jack. Introduce yourself. Oh, thanks, Esther. This is Jack Gansel, and I've been in the uh, embedded, in embedded systems side of uh, the computer business since um, the early 1970s, so I'm a certified old fart. And uh, I am sort of the curmudgeon, I suspect, of the group. Uh, in my industry, it's, uh, the, the, everything is a little bit different than, uh, in, for example, IT or web design or, or even PC programming. And uh, I, have, I am a great believer in, in many of the agile practices, but I've seen a lot of uh, agile teams that uh, uh, use agile as a cover for basically uh, uh, chaos. And uh, I, I, I'm a strong believer in code reviews, and uh, uh, whether they're done with an Agile team or not, I think it's hugely important. OK. Next slide. <laughs> to the man behind the curtain. OK. And, well, OK, and this is, this is uh, essentially my take on it. Uh, uh, code reviews have been demonstrated time and time again, uh, time and time again, to be uh, probably one of the most most powerful tools we have for creating quality software efficiently. And um, I'm a supporter of any any development strategy that uh, makes use of code reviews in a disciplined fashion. Okay, Jared, you're on. All right. Hi, guys. This is Jared Richardson. I've, gosh, sold my first program back in 91, uh, so I've not been in the field as long as some of you, but I've been doing it for a while. The first book I wrote was Ship It, where we actually wrote about peer code reviews back in, wow, um, 2005 for the Pragmatic Programmers. It's now in seven languages, and the section on code reviews is one of the most often quoted and cited. Today, I actually work for a defense contractor. I'm an internal Agile coach where we do a little bit of that embedded work uh, Jack was just talking about, as well as some web uh, technology. I've worked with Java, Ruby, C, C++. Um, and currently, some of the jokes we've had preparing for this, uh, I'm a backyard chicken farmer, but we probably won't touch on that too much in the, in the webinar. Although, we did consider having chicken farmer as our hashtag. That would be awesome. We could do that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, let's, see, let's hit the next slide. My perspective on code reviews. I remember when XP was new, and a lot of the adherents, I don't think too many of the leaders, were really religious about it, where you have to be pairing all the time, 24 hours a day. You know, you go into the bathroom together. and These sorts of things didn't really work for me at that level. Um, but I found a lot of benefit to the lightweight peer code review that I think we're going to be talking on today. I've been doing it for years, love it as a practice, and be, it's going to be interesting hearing uh, questions from the audience and what the other panelists have to say as well. And speaking of other panelists, Dave. Hi, folks. I'm uh, Dave Rooney. Uh, I'm an agile coach and recovering software developer, uh, although I fall off the wagon uh, constantly. Uh, I've been uh, building software since I had dark hair and uh, involved with uh, agile since I had some dark hair. 
I'm not quite as old as uh, uh, as Jack. I haven't been around the industry quite that long, and, and but longer than Jared, so I guess I'm kind of the middle-aged part. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. My position on this is I discovered, uh, didn't, I found out about uh, extreme programming uh, in late 2000 while I was actually pair programming. Didn't realize it had a term. It, uh, the other person I was working with, we just called it collaborating. Uh, but we really were pair programming and uh, got into XP and the agile world through that. Um, when I'm working with groups, when I'm coaching and such, I don't specifically tell them about pair, pair programming. What I do say is that every line of production code needs to be seen by at least two pairs of eyes before it's committed. There's a multitude of different ways you can do that. And uh, I believe, uh, we'll talk about a bunch of those uh, today during the, uh, during the webinar. Thanks. Okay. So instead of uh, all, all you webinar listener ends, um, instead of having everybody do a PowerPoint and, and go through all their deep thoughts and then find out how much we agree or disagree. We decided to take this on uh, an attitude of, of we're just going to open up a question and have a panel discussion. And at the end, we will open this up to Q&A. You can enter your cues anytime you want. That gives us some time to prioritize them and collect them and figure out what everybody's asking and so forth. Um, so our first question, as we wait. Uh, is what's different about code reviews when you're doing Agile? What is the distinction that you guys see for good or ill? Um, let's see. I'll pick one randomly. Dave, you go first. Sure. Thanks, Esther. Well, generally, uh, it happens a lot more often and uh, it follows uh, the, the, the lean principle of uh, just in time, uh, uh, at least when I'm working with people and trying to get them to do reviews, trying to do small reviews as uh, quickly and as often as possible. Um, I tell people to follow the principle of if something hurts, do it as often as you can. And uh, generally, the people I deal with, if they have been doing code reviews before, it's been painful. Okay. Jack? Uh, okay, sure. I, I find it interesting, um, uh, Kent Beck's position on uh, code reviews in his book, Ex uh, Extreme Program Programming Explained. He says that... Uh, we know how important code reviews are, so and as he puts it, we'll turn a knob all the way up to 10 and we'll be doing them all the time. And my understanding is he advocates that mostly through the peer, uh, or the, uh, peer programming process. Uh, my take on that is uh, uh, that's a very personal thing. Uh, some people love it, some don't. I think I'd kill my peer after about six hours, but that's just me. Um, but I think that that's, that's a, a very good thing. See, all two heads are better than one approach if it's being done uh, carefully so that people are really concentrating and focusing. You know, I've watched an awful lot of teams operate, and it's not rare to see the uh, non-typing member of, the, of an XP pair sort of uh, you know, with the glazed eyes, you know, staring off into infinity uh, rather than really being engaged in the code. So, you know, it's like any any process. It takes discipline in order for it to be effective. Um, I know, or my understanding is that for some of the other panelists here, they their belief is that uh, that code review should be done prior to, for example, check into the version control system. And I presume what that means is uh, that's post uh, testing. So you're taking code that mostly works. And I'm on a I I, I disagree. I think uh, there's a couple of magical things about code reviews. Uh, one of them, of course, is that they find bugs. Uh, the second thing is that testing as it is usually practiced, and there's, there are plenty of uh, you know, cases where it's done better, but the, the data is clear. Testing as it's usually practiced typically only exercises about half the code. Because some stuff is just really hard to exercise, you know, like exception handlers and stuff. Um, and what code review then does is it ensures that there has been at least some some level of auditing about the uh, code that both is and maybe has not been tested, so you're sure that it's working. And uh, the third thing that I think is really magical about code review is that, and there's tons of data to back this up, is that it's much more efficient than tests or as I, I prefer to call it, debugging. Um, 
that uh, code reviews find typically 70 to 80 percent of the bugs, but at a much higher rate of speed than they're found doing uh, by doing uh, tests. So I prefer to see code reviews done uh, before something goes into tests. For example, using pair programming, that's, that's a case where things are done right. Um, and uh, I, mean, I, just, I guess I'd have to say it's something I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. And I would uh, I recommend that uh, whatever agile method were being used, that, uh, that uh, test would be somewhat more decoupled than it often is from coding. So for example, in test-driven development, those two can be very closely coupled. In order to uh, have a, that we can interject a, a code review step in there before the testing. Just because let's face it, we're not, we're having sort of a, a talk before this started about fun. And uh, the truth is, we're not doing this. We're not um, writing code for fun. I mean, I sure, sure as hell hope we're having fun. But uh, this is really a business endeavor. And the only reason we're doing this is to uh, help the business make a profit, which means that uh, we've got to use the most efficient tools and processes that we can possibly come up with. Well, taking the traditional prerogative of a panel to take a question and, and go left with it, <laughs> let me, uh, it's more fun this way. For what you just said, Jack, your, your comments seem to imply that their tests are going to be run once, which I would actually, or in one place, which I would disagree with. I am a huge fan of continuous integration and having the complete test suite there, which means unit test, package level, integration, everything I can get my grubby little hands on runs on the CI server, obviously, after the code is checked in. Because what I found, and myself included, no matter how, how good my intentions are or how often I heck, at this age, and I'm only the, I'm the youngest of the group, you know, as often as I remember running all those tests, I find most developers don't always run the tests on their desktop before they check them in. So what I, my workflow or the process that I advocate is run the tests that are relevant to the area you're working in, and we hope we get those run. I don't count on it though. Then I get the peer code review, then you check in the code, and then your CI server runs everything. And for what you missed or what your local environment didn't have the data for or your local environment was not matching the production environment, we bounce it back again. How does that mesh with what you were thinking? Um, well, I, I really appreciate your insight there and um, I, I, I largely agree. Um, even for the most dyed-in-the-wool uh, uh, advocate of the traditional plan-driven, you know, non-agile approaches. Uh, even the most, you know, you know, the most extreme of those people has got to take away uh, a, just a pure delight in the agile movement's approach to tests. I mean, the fact is, agile stressing tests the way they do is just brilliant. Um, and but I don't think that's enough. And and I I, I, don't, I don't think I'm contradicting anything you would say. I think that um, uh, tests, well, I like to think in terms of quality gates. I like to, for example, one quality gate is uh, the compiler, you know, find syntax errors. Uh, I like to use other tools like lint and static analyzers and stuff as another gate to sort out problems. Inspections are another quality gate. Testing is another one. Um, and none of those individually is going to be adequate. They all come together to form a whole. Um, the problem with test, uh, well, there's a couple of problems with problems with tests. T too often, as I said, they they miss things. It's it's very hard to build a test which is comprehensive. And and the truth is, I'm a really dumb person. All I know is my field, which is embedded systems. So I can only speak to that. It's very difficult in many, in most embedded systems to actually create an automatic test because someone has to wash the displays and punch the buttons and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And I, I argued with a, a lot of folks about stubbing, and yes, you can stub out some of the stuff. But, you know, as NASA says, test what you fly, fly what you test. You know, don't don't uh, rely on tests on something that's not uh, the flight article. Now, to, to, to sort of counter my own argument, 
I am seeing some companies doing some brilliant stuff using stuff like uh, National Instruments Lab View, and that actually has a, a vision module. And I have seen tests, automatic test setups where they take a TV camera that watches the embedded system, all the blinking lights and the displays and stuff, and the uh, vision module parses it and can pull ASCII streams out of it, which can then run into a test computer. And so it, it's possible to do better than most folks do with tests in the embedded space. Um, but it certainly is not easy. Jack, if I can jump in here. The, um, uh, it might be good to uh, talk a bit about definitions of tests. You're talking about <laughs> literally end-to-end -end tests. You guys are, are segueing into our next question anyway, so let's put All that right. one up on the screen since we're sort of right. there already, which is do different types of software require different inspection strategies? Well, it's not, not quite what I was getting to, but the, yeah. uh, what, what I do want to talk about is end-to-end -end tests, and absolutely you need end-to-end -end tests, but my experience has been, and I've been the last uh, coaching the last 18 months at a large telecom writing wireless uh, switch software, and everything back to social media and uh, database basher applications for admin assistance uh, over, over the years. When you run into defects, whether you've had code reviews or not, you're still, in a lot of cases, you're dealing with two fundamental uh, different things. One is true logic programming errors. The, the, the programmer screwed up. And the other is either misinterpreted uh, misunderstood, uh, unclear requirements, that sort of thing. But when you're dealing with an approach like TDD, where you are writing test after test after test after test while you're developing the code, that almost eliminates 100% of at least the programmer errors, and it, it certainly allows the, the people doing the work to uh, flesh out that uh, the cases where they're not uh, understanding the requirements. You can go back, well, my tests say this. So here's, what, here's why I wrote the test like this. And you can have, uh, it allows you to, uh, to ask the questions like that. Uh, I've yet to see a case where a code inspection uh, uh, allowed you to have a conversation like that with someone meaningful. At least uh, you had uh, tests that were, hey, our tests are passing, but you're saying the requirement's wrong? Um, I guess we missed a test case. If you did actually have a logic error, you have uh, a benchmark as opposed to code inspections that tend to be, uh, they're not persistent as such. You've done, done the inspection, you may or may not have found things, uh, you may or may not have, uh, uh, have changed things, and then it's gone. At least tests are persistent and can be run again. And I'm talking about automated tests. I'm not talking about just a, uh, a set of, uh, of manual tests that have been, and the steps have been defined. So I think we need to distinguish what we're talking about here. Um, I would, uh, I have difficulty, based on my experience, uh, reconciling with your statement that reviews are more efficient than, uh, than tests and finding bugs before the test. But I think that might have to do with the different granularity or different size of the test that we're talking about. Yes, uh, reviews may be more efficient than large end-to-end -end tests, but when I'm writing micro tests or, or unit tests, um, I would suggest that no, that's not the case, especially if I'm pairing, or at the very least, I have someone reviewing very close to the time that I'm, uh, I'm writing that test. I, um, I actually just shared a, a link with the panelists. When I was doing some quick prep for this conversation, for this, uh, the webinar, I stumbled across a chart now, I think they actually uh, probably ripped it off directly from that blog posting I, I put out there from Steve McConnell's Code Complete Chapter 20. And he's showing the various, uh, various tools we can use to rat out bugs, right? The regression tests, the code reviews, unit tests, and so forth. And the conclusion of the chart is nothing is good enough. No one technique will get us there, right? We have to have code reviews. We have to have unit tests. We have to have integration tests. It, uh, the chart's pretty interesting. I don't know that we want to go into that because we can't really show it to the attendees. But the other thing I wanted to throw out, and I'm very curious to hear if Jack or, or Dave is familiar with the test-driven development for embedded C book that the, uh, what, James Grinning just released a couple months back on the Pragmatic Programmers line. Uh, yeah, actually I reviewed that book and wrote the uh, forward for it. And, uh, you know, uh, James is a, is a good buddy. He's a really smart guy and a good guy. And we, 
we have had some uh, spirited debates about test driven <laughs> development, shall I say? <laughs> and uh, <It's> more fun. <laughs> it is. It's a ton of fun. It really is. This is such a fascinating field, and uh, mm -hmm. we can have good-natured uh, disagreements and uh, enjoy enjoy the discussion, and everyone can learn things at the same time. Yeah. Uh, hey, this uh, this curve or this chart that you pulled up here, Jared, is a uh, uh, great, and basically it's showing exactly what I'm what I said was thinking in terms of quality gates. Uh, we need to do a lot of different things to cap to capture all the bugs. To my knowledge, there's not a lot. Or maybe there's no good real data that's been acquired about uh, the efficacy, for example, of uh, you know you know PICAT, you know, TDD or XP or whatever it might be, compared to, for example, uh, a more traditional approach in terms of uh, you know quality and the like. And uh, that's unfortunate because it would be great to have some numbers. I I know everyone feels great about it these approaches, but uh, feeling good is not part of the deal, you know. We want to, we want to have some quantitative data. The, uh, I, I have a ton of data on uh, traditional uh, code reviews or, you know, there, there's so many different names, code inspections, you name it, um, that indicate that um, typically you're going to find uh, about 80% of the bugs uh, if you do good inspections before you do testing. And the, uh, the, the uh, rate is somewhere on the order of about 15 to 20 times faster uh, using inspections than, than tests. Now, you brought up a great point, Dave, about what kind of tests. And listening between the lines, I almost saw, thought it sounded like you weren't, you're not a big advocate. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounded like um, you sort of think um, the inspections or, or the reviews are uh, at least or less important, perhaps, than the tests. And, uh, well, like I don't know, the, that's not a fair uh, thing to say. Well, like the test that you... Jump in here just a second, just with Esther again. Uh, sure. we, I'm asking Smart Bear to post the, that uh, link that you guys just shared with Among Us, to post that on the at Smart Bear Twitter feed. So people should be able to find that soon if it's not already up there. And I also oh. posted it under the, pound, the hashtag Agile Code Review as well. Oh, cool. As long as it's there. Yeah. Um, sorry, getting back, uh, uh, two quick things. Um, one quick question to Jared, and I'll get back to you, Jack, in just a second. Um, that reference from Code Complete, is that the uh, version that uh, Steve McConnell wrote uh, before the XP uh, stuff came out? Um, I don't know which one. It just referenced it as being Chapter 20, and there was the chart. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, because that really uh, was a fundamental shift in how we approached uh, uh, testing as, a, uh, as an industry. Um, so I, I, yes, that's a very interesting chart. Yes, I agree with it. However, I think the world has changed a little bit since uh, Steve first wrote that. So uh, I, I would uh, uh, take it with, well, one grain of salt, not, uh, not an entire uh, box of it. Uh, Jack, getting back to your comment, the, I absolutely agree with code inspections, and I think uh, I, what might be the seed of our, uh, uh, our our disagreement might be that when I talk about tests, I'm talking about very small tests happening on the order uh, of uh, a minute, two minutes that you're taking to write, and you're writing code, the true TDD cycle. Uh, you may be thinking or, or working from the perspective of larger tests that, yes, it does uh, take a lot of effort. You, you talk about testing is very tough, and you might only get 50% coverage from uh, from these large tests. Absolutely. When I'm dealing with micro tests, uh, I can get very high coverage. Uh, yes, I'm stubbing, mocking, faking all over the place. So, am I testing the interactions or the uh, the integrations of things? Generally, no. I'm testing down at the class level, down at the method level, to make sure that the bits work uh, work well. The bits still have to go together. You still need a higher level of testing, and yes, you do need a higher level of inspection. I'm okay with that. Uh, I do agree that inspections will find a lot of uh, a lot of defects, but what is the cost of introducing the defect and the length of time it takes to actually find that, be it through an inspection or another uh, another mechanism? If you can if you can get that length of time to uh, as near zero as possible, be it finding a bug through a test, finding a bug through uh, through having a pair sitting with you and working on it, 
then uh, th that's your goal. Um, is that does that qualify as an inspection under your definition? Um, I'll I, I I will completely defer to Kent Beck and. Uh, where he says uh, that you know one of the advantage, one of the important reasons for pair programming is the the sort of real time code inspection and uh, it just seems uh, perfectly natural for me to to believe that it's certainly you know it's the old two heads are better than one thing mm -hmm. um, so yeah I think it is it is certainly a code review and it's a uh, you know I think that they can be if they're done well can be very effective and the nice thing about that is that um, the review is being done. Um, as the code's being created, so you're immediately finding problems rather than waiting um, uh, till later in the game. I mean, you bring, bring up an important point, Dave, about the TDD cycle. And uh, in the embedded world, uh, there are some TDD folks. I mean, you look at James Grenning, for example, uh, and he coaches uh, embedded groups. But it's a very small part of the market, and uh, so there's not there's not you know much in terms of uh, good data about how effective it is and I, I travel all over the world talking to uh, embedded groups and I almost never, matter of fact, I can count them on one hand the number of times I've run into a group that's actually doing TDD. So I, I can't really address it as fully perhaps as uh, you can because it's sort of the, the aberration in, in this industry. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I had lunch with uh, James uh, earlier uh, at, uh, at noon today. He's uh, <laughs> consulting at the client I'm with right now, and he told me to give you hell, so. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, two things each of you said that I w I'd like to compare and contrast. Um, Dave, you made the, the very correct comment that tests are persistent, right? The test can be run over and over and over and over, and by embedding the knowledge in the test, you've got an artifact that you can keep with the product, and, and mm -hmm. I agree with that. But at the same time, Jack, you're advocating for the code reviews. And one thing I don't think anyone's mentioned is the benefit you get out of actually improving your people. If I'm reviewing your code and you're reviewing my code, I'm learning from you. Sure. Right? I'm the, yes, the tests are a persistent artifact, and I love those. In fact, I'm, a lot of people think I'm a full-time tester because I push that topic so hard. I, I am passionate about that. But at the same time, I've never seen another technique that is, is good for taking a group of junior or mid-level people and bringing them up to the next level as pairing them up with somebody who's as good or better than them and doing those lightweight peer code reviews. You know, Jared, okay. you're, you're spot on. I, it, it, I think we really have far more agreement uh, here among the three of us than disagreement, and I agree with uh, about the persistency of the test. In terms of what you're saying about, um, you know, bringing juniors up to speed. The, uh, one of the powerful things about a code review is that we get to read great code. And whether you're a junior engineer or a senior engineer, we can always get better. And uh, it, I, I'm always struck, this is such a screwy field. I mean, if you wanted to be a great composer, you'd, you'd listen to a lot of music, read a lot of scores before you did any. Or a great novelist, you'd read a lot of books. But in Computer Science 101, the teacher says, OK, here's a printf. Now you, Go home and write some home. Your homework is to write some code. It's it's nuts, and uh, uh, one of the powerful benefits I agree of a code review is that we are constantly reading great code. That's probably the best way we can we can actually learn better ways of writing great code. You guys, are, this is Esther again. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but Grady Booch has said on a number of occasions that he believes that. Computer science courses should, you know, in order to major in computer science, you should have a semester in which you're reading great code. Uh, <laughs> the way that if you're an English major, you spend many semesters reading the classics, and he feels that it's just as important for developers to uh, to look at great code, whether it's you know the elegance of um, you know the original MacWrite or something, as an, been given as an example of. Boy, is that just gorgeous code that managed to do a lot in small resources and so forth. Uh, well, so that I'll tell also you. fits into that whole notion of reading great code. Um, I, I've often advocated uh, that uh, computer science students shouldn't be allowed to write any code until junior year because coding is only one aspect of uh, software engineering. I prefer to call this software engineering over programming. Programming is a relatively mechanical act. 
Um, the harder part by far is design. Uh, and Esther, like you say, a beautiful, beautiful design. Um, that those are the components that are really tough, and programming is uh, is is not the uh, the hardest thing here. No, I, I think uh, uh, the the whole engineering debate is a webinar of its own, and I, I'm not going to go on that one. <laughs> but my only my only comment there is uh, that uh, beautiful code is like saying beautiful music. Uh, beautiful to whom? Uh, <laughs> Uh, in the three of us on the panel, uh, we may have completely different views of what uh, what's beautiful, and I certainly know that uh, your the way you look at the world and, and different personalities see things differently. Um, I prefer loads of white space in code when I'm reading it. So um, maybe I'm ADD or something like that. But uh, when I have a whole screen full of just really condensed code, it's visual noise to me. I have very very you know, great difficulty digging into that, as opposed to other people I've worked with where they want everything they can possibly get squeezed onto the screen so they can see as much of the code as possible. Uh, and, and it works for them. It's not that they're wrong, and it's not that I'm wrong, it's we're different. So uh, yeah, again, going to get beautiful code I think is a rat hole that we should probably avoid. What should we should probably off a slide, like uh, up a slide or two since we've managed to go into <laughs> hopefully interesting to other people uh, tangents. Um, I, have, have we touched on inspection strategies as much as we want to, or shall we? Well, this forward? is Jared. I'm, I was actually going to segue exactly off of what he said and try to bring it back to that. What does a beautiful yeah. review look like? I'm not sure I understand. What does a beautiful review look like? Yeah. What's, what, what if a review you come away going, man, that was awesome? Is it you know? For me, they've got to be lightweight, right? Five to fifteen minutes, which means it's not a lot of code. It's got to be frequent. I want the review. I've, I've reviewed code five or six times a day, but I never want it to be more than two days. If, you're, if you've got two weeks or two months worth of code, I call those code bombs. Yep. You're coming in with so much code, you're just going to kill me. My eyes are going to glaze over. It's not a, uh, for me, it's not a scheduled event on Thursday where I bring in 30 of my coworkers. We dim the lights. and They're usually scheduled right after lunch, so you can all go to sleep. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to interrupt the way you work. I'm going to come in and say, do you have time? And if you're busy, I'm going to leave you alone. I'm not going to turn it into an interrupt-driven shop. And if you say, what's this variable mean, I'm going to go, aha, bad variable name. If you make me explain an algorithm to you five times, I'm going to guess it needs to be in a subroutine with a good name on it. I'm going to listen to the feedback. Um, what about you guys? Did I step on your toes with any of those? Or you like that? Or No, oh, I, I, I uh, yeah. Dave here. Uh, one of the things we're yeah, going to a later slide talking about, uh, not horror stories, but uh, uh, problem reviews is where you come in with a code bomb and people say, well, we've already tested it when you suggest changes. It's already been tested. We don't want to mess with it, which defeats the whole purpose. But if you're doing these scheduled reviews, then uh, you could run into that uh, run into that situation. That's a real-world scenario I've encountered. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, the idea of a code bomb is just appalling to me and uh, I think uh, reviews, I mean I, I think this is sort of like pornography, it's sort of hard, hard to define but you know when you see it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, if you are doing more than an hour of a review in a day, your brain is going to be turning to mush and I often tell people that if you're presented with thousands of lines of code that you have to review, you really only have two choices and those are either find a different job or suicide. Um, <laughs> So I think a beautiful review is one that's effective. And I always advocate uh, the use of uh, collect the collecting metrics to see how we're doing. Um, OK, we did this review. What leaked through it? And if we're finding that a lot of stuff is leaking through it, a lot of bugs are leaking through it, you know, then we should be thinking about some sort of feedback loop to try to tune what we're doing so that uh, each of these steps, each of these quality gates is more effective. Right. So how about the Zune bug then? The uh, famous uh, leap year 2008 uh, bug that uh, not only was reviewed internally within Microsoft, but it was reviewed by hundreds if not thousands of people afterwards when they posted the, uh, posted the code. And everybody still, they, they looked at the code and said, oh, well, there's the bug right there. Yes, they, they found part of the bug, but it wasn't the whole bug. And only through writing tests would you be able to identify what the real bug 
was? Well, number number one, they didn't identify it. I presume they had some some level of test. I mean, everything gets tested. Um, even the most dysfunctional companies I know of, and they're really broken, uh, do <laughs> do some testing. Mm -hmm. uh, the real question there would the tester have been wise enough to have thought about? Uh, oh, geez, leap years. I mean, that that takes sort of a you know a, a, a step back to uh, thinking about this from a much broader standpoint. Um, and bugs bugs will leak through. I mean the uh, the, the numbers are pretty dramatic. The absolute best in class companies only find about 99% of the bugs in their code before they ship. And, you know, with a very few exceptions, like, you know, some of the avionics stuff. But 99% is considered about as best as you can get without starting to spend gobs of money on, on this. So as bugs leak out, it means it's going to happen. I think um, our slide has been advanced. I know, I, all I, right. Have we have we hit on yeah have, have we hit on all these uh, various agile approaches on TDD versus XP et cetera? I think we've touched on these things. Any, anybody want to add anything? Or have we? I, I, I certainly would, uh, Dave. Here, I, would, I certainly wouldn't. Uh, uh, the question there is TDD a standalone practice or part of the XP? Mm -hmm. um, TDD is one that you can absolutely do and and not be doing. XP at the same time, uh, you can extract that practice. Now, XP is greater than the sum of the parts, uh, yada, 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 all those wonderful mom and apple pie things. But if you're only going to do TDD, you generally should be better than, uh, than you would be doing long delayed or long uh, uh, latency testing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I see TDD being used uh, standalone or as part of XP, um, and I, I'm not I'm not a fan of TDD standalone. Um, I think when it's used as part of uh, extreme programming, I think it's uh, uh, you know a little more more disciplined. And uh, but I will admit I have no data either way. I've been I've been really struggling to find data on the efficacy of these things, and, and haven't had a whole lot of luck. This is Jared. Do you guys, when you come in to work with a client, ever bring in single practice here or there, like? lightweight code reviews or TDD or something like that as a way to, you know, slowly heat up the water to slowly affect the transformation? Or do you find it's more effective to bring in an entire Agile approach? Well, after, uh, Dave here, uh, after I try to bring in the whole approach and they say no, yes, then I, I will go with individual uh, uh, standalone practices. Well, you know, I say this is Jack as a... Uh, I grew up in Washington D.C. during the Vietnam experience, and uh, you know we we were out protesting and all this stuff, and all of us hippies thought we could change the world, and well, it turns out we could, and uh, but we could affect small change, and uh, I always tell companies, look, that's there are these all these things you should be thinking about doing, but at the very least, let's put a uh, I'll draw a line in the sand, and from this point forward, at the very least, let's start cherry picking pieces of best practices and using those and uh, then you know as you get comfortable with them we can add more and add more okay. just an effort of time I think that this conversation could go on for hours I can tell <laughs> yeah um, let's, <laughs> let's keep moving to the next item which is magic what's the this kind of is it flip side of the what did, uh, you know what was your great experience? The code review. Let's just do a, a, a quickie on the uh, worst example of code review you've seen or encountered. Well, Jack, you're, uh, it's, I've seen so many. It's really hard to pick a worst. <laughs> uh, there are so many ways that they can go wrong. Um, the typical big problems I see is when nobody cares. I mean, basically, people go in and they say, oh, yeah, management's making us do this stuff. Geez, what a waste of time! And what happens is they don't, they don't put any deep thought into it. There's no preparation. It's it's done listlessly, and um, and then it's just not effective. But if I could twist it, I was at the Embedded Systems Conference a couple of weeks ago, and a VP of a medical company grabbed me and said, "Hey, since they started doing, um, they actually incorporated both the use of software standards and code reviews at the same time." They did keep metrics. They've shaved 40% off their development schedules as a result. 
any other? Oops, sorry, go ahead, Jared. Oh, thanks. Uh, Jared, I was just going to share a quick worst example. I had a person at a conference once tell me they had a monthly, or maybe even more frequently than that, but it was, it was fairly regular code reviews where they would drag 80 people into a room <laughs> and put the code, they would pick one person for each time. And they would take everything that person had written since the last code review and put it up on the overhead. And literally, they said, you felt like you'd been beaten with a stick. You had people that had been in the field for 20, 30, 40 years just calling you an idiot five ways to Friday. And, you know, you didn't learn anything except to, to code as little as possible because then people had less to pick on you about. Did they at least give you a teddy bear to hold? <laughs> I, I, they didn't tell I, I'm that actually probably. not being facetious. I know that from, from you know, fiction writers, will, will, when they go around and review somebody's work, um, they will, you know, the good ones anyway, give somebody a teddy bear so they have something to hold on to. Uh, it's not a bad tip. <laughs> no, if, if, if you're stuck in one of those you can't, that you can't change, I could imagine teddy bear being a fairly easy thing to insert. I think um, you've just stumbled across uh, Smart Bear's next uh, conference uh, <laughs> swag giveaway. <laughs> so. that, that wouldn't be hurt. So. Okay, well, we do have some good questions, so I want to keep us moving. Uh, so we have a few minutes to address them. Um, any things that we learned the hard way? Or we, I think we may have hit those in, in the... So. Okay, let's see. Questions. We have some really good ones. Um, Let's see, one question was, how would you rank code reviews as a quality gate compared to unit test, static code analysis, and other gates? Oh, well, I, th <laughs> I think that they often find different kinds of things. So it's sort of like saying, you know, you know, uh, what's better, breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Well, you know, you really need all three of those. Um, and uh, code reviews are, have a different purpose, as Jared mentioned. Um, part of it is so that we learn better ways of writing great code. Uh, I've seen them used very effectively for teaching newbies. Uh, and they, they tend to elevate the quality of the code from the very beginning. Because if I write code that nobody's going to look at, it's one kind of code. If I know my colleagues are going to go through it, I'm a whole lot more careful. So just having the reviews automatically elevates the code. Um, so I, I would call this, this, this is a critical quality gate, but it's a, it's a different quality gate from unit tests and you know, static analysis, syntactical checkers. They all, all are for finding different kinds of things. Right. I have absolute agreement with that. Um, now, the, the format of the code review or how the code review is done, uh, as for Jack and I may quibble with uh, Dave here, <laughs> that, uh, and Jack, you mentioned that there are so many ways that a, a you can go wrong, which sounds an awful lot uh, like there are so many ways that people uh, aren't doing pairing right. So you're saying that they aren't doing reviews right. Well, they aren't doing pairing right. Uh, my experience with uh, pair programming has been universally positive and getting feedback quickly. You say that uh, if you know that someone else is going to be looking at your code, you're going to do it better. That's absolutely true. It absolutely reflects my experience over the past 10, 11 years. If that person is sitting beside you engaged, uh, and you're swapping pairing partners uh, every hour or so, or, or even uh, just depending on the situation, uh, much more often than once a week or even once a day, then yes, you're getting a constant review. People are going to be asking you why you're doing things. So when you have to explain it back, you're going to do it a bit better. But in terms of uh, uh, the value, uh, again, both are necessary but insufficient on their own. Uh, you, uh, you really, really need to do both to be uh, to be truly effective. Okay. Yeah, this is Jared. It's oil and tires. Which one do you need for your car? Yeah. Uh, okay. You can choose one or the other, but you make a lot better time if you have them both. Okay. Next question: What's your recommended flow for performing code reviews in agile development after or before check-in? <laughs> Someone's trying to get this thing going past the hour mark. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have an elevator ride worth of answer. Well, this is Jared. <laughs> um, I do. I always want. I, I tell teams you always get a review before you check in the code. Um, you know, run the tests you can that are specific to what you're doing. You know, to your local area. 
then get your review, check it in, then we get what we get from CI. And if you break a test in continuous integration, you're going to get another review. Yeah, Dave, your um, I tell teams again that uh, there are many ways to actually perform a code review. Uh, pair programming is one. It's a very good one. Uh, peer programming, where I write the code and Jack looks at it and commits it to source control for me. So it's Jack's Jack's name that's on uh, uh, on that code and source control. That's another way to do it. And there's also the open source model where you have dedicated committers. You submit a patch to them, they review it, and if they feel it uh, meets the various standards and such, they'll commit it. In all cases, the code is reviewed prior to being committed to source control. And, and I'll, I'll put it, there's a jack, a little uh, different twist on it. Uh, as, as I've said before, I think the uh, code review has to happen before the test. But um, in terms of committing it to the version of the source control system, uh, I'm sort of a believer in checking stuff in frequently, even if it's not ready to be checked in as, uh, as, as people often think. In other words, there's a lot of reasons for a source control system, and one of the important ones is it's in, uh, the, the, the database, all that source is backed up every night by the IT folks, and uh, engineers will never back up their own hard disks. And so even if I have incomplete stuff, I do like to check it in and mark that it's incomplete simply for, in case something horrible goes wrong so that the source won't get lost. Jack, if I could ask a question there, what's your definition of frequent? Uh, oh, uh, I, would, I would typically say at least daily. Okay, no, that's fine. Uh, I tend to work on even smaller increments than that, but, uh, but okay, daily cool. is a good start. Great. I, this is Jared. I check in. If, it, if it's half an hour, I'm having a slow day. I check <laughs> in all the time. But if it's not ready you know, to be shared with the team, I'll always, in any subversion or whatever source code you're using at the top level, I'll have a folder called the sandbox. And anything can be checked into the sandbox. A sandbox, user IDs, and then put it there, and then you can move it when it's ready to be moved or, or whatever works for you. But um, yeah, I agree. Check it in frequently. Get it off your computer. I've got a question that this is sort of a, a process slash scope question, which is, uh, it was directed specifically at Jared, how can you avo avoid code bombs while well, many developers are developing lots of code? I think that the larger meta question in that is, uh, when you have bigger teams, how do you manage, how do you manage to do that, to do all the right things? Uh, we know that there's just going to be lots of code on this project by the nature of what needs to be done. Any thoughts on that? Sure. There, there's going to be lots of code, but the problem, oh gosh, you talk about a big question. That, that'll be the <laughs> next webinar. Um, the problem is when somebody takes a feature, and, and go back to that movie, The Money Pit, right? The, the plumbers kept saying two weeks, right? You come back in a week, how much more work do you have? Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. You ask the standard developer how long they're going to be working on something. What do they say? Well, this will take me two weeks. Well, when you say two weeks, that tells me you haven't thought through it. I find it is an extremely rare developer who can fit more than two to three to four days worth of work in their head. So if you're working on something and it's been a week, it's because you don't really understand what you're working on. You've glossed over the hard parts. So to avoid a code bomb, take whatever task you've been given. Go back and break out the old XP 3x5 cards. Okay, you don't have, live in a database, right, if your company lives in a database, but put your work on the 3 by 5 cards as a, you know, role, I want feature, so that, and then on the back, when do you know it's done, but use that to break down the work into small chunks. And so I've got one day's worth of work on this card. I'll work on as little of one feature or, as, or one bug, get as little work done as possible, and then check it in. So that's what I do for myself. My desk is littered with 3 by 5 cards. Even though I'm working on larger projects, I take chunks of those projects and check those in as I go. And, and presumably, review, you know, if you have a smaller chunk, then that's available to be reviewed. So it's, there may be lots of chunks, but they're, uh, in, they're not bombs. It's, it's, like yes. one, one, it's, it's like eating pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. I'll take one more little piece. And eventually, mm -hmm. you will pie anyway. 
Exactly. Well, that's you know. But if anyone ever catches you, you can say, "I'm just having one bite." That's what you're shooting <laughs> for, right? <laughs> one, a wafer thin mint. <laughs> well, uh, Jack here, I have a, a slightly different twist. I mean, I, I basically agree with you, but um, I come from more of the plan, non-agile sort of community, and uh, I find that the way to one way to avoid code bombs is to apply agile-like practices. For example, you may schedule traditional, old-fashioned, even Fagan code reviews, but frequently, maybe every single day. You might not have, you might not know what's getting reviewed, but it's in the schedule so that uh, frequently, maybe every day, uh, you're doing uh, reviews, and uh, that means that you never accumulate a whole pile of code that um, that you will hopelessly try to uh, review. Okay. Um. We had time for like two more questions. I'm gonna. I'm, so I'm looking through our, our list here. Um, this is a mentoring question, I guess. So how can we use the metrics to actually show that our junior programmers learn to code cleaner and even better to design? In other words, you know, hopefully both review and agile are, are um, helping everybody develop quality software sooner and faster. But on the junior programmers, how do you find out, you know, whether it's working? <laughs> well, I think that the worst thing we can do is use metrics generated during the review to evaluate people. The deal with a code review is to uh, make great code, and um, you know there are some other benefits all along the way. But as soon as we start evaluating people with what we find, then we're going to find people will start playing with the metrics. So uh, if the uh, metric is very few bugs, well, people will find very few bugs. If the metric is find a lot of bugs, well, they'll write code with a lot of bugs. Um, I think that the people should be evaluated and uh, uh, evaluated very uh, orthogonally from the from the code process of development uh, itself. The boss may look at things like schedule compliance, being willing to uh, you know engage with whatever processes that we've decided we're going to use, and and those sorts of things. But I think if we uh, start counting bugs and correlate that to salary, for example, boy, we're in for a lot of trouble. Right. Uh, to Dave here to tack onto that, uh, I'm less interested in whether a a junior is through code reviews becoming uh, measurably uh, better through some sort of metric as opposed to how's the team as a whole doing? Is is a team improving? Because if the team is improving. The peer pressure within the team will bring up people who aren't necessarily contributing to it, rather than looking for specifically to individuals. Uh, look at the team level. And, uh, and this is Jared. If you have a need to evaluate people, don't try to spreadsheet them. Don't try to manage by spreadsheet. Ask the people that are doing the code reviews. Let people review the people. Right? If you've got a, a team, a junior team that's in trouble. And you pick out a handful of seniors and say all the code reviews have to go through these seniors, you know, for the next month. Go to those senior developers and say, how are they doing? Are they getting better? Or are they getting worse? People are pretty good at that sort of thing. Okay, and this will be our last question. Um, let's see what will be our last question. Um, Boxers or briefs? Yeah, <laughs> that could be good. Um, Depends on the temperature. There was, there was a question about tools, especially when the pair is not co-located. Um, and I guess because <laughs> to make this about about tools in general, I should point out that we are that this webinar is sponsored by SmartPair Software. Uh, so you should obviously check those folks out. We like to think that everything they sell is great. Um, but any thoughts on uh, tools or other code review slash agile issues? Uh, when you're not co-located. Right, uh, Dave here. If I can go into uh, be my uh, put on my extreme programming hat, um, I've done distributed XP. Uh, we were all XP practitioners for many years before we did this, so uh, we didn't we weren't learning the process. But just by name, by virtue of the company, there was myself here in Ottawa, somebody in Toronto, someone in uh, uh, Virginia, a couple people in the Bay Area, one guy in Seattle. Uh, we used Skype and VNC, and we uh, paired virtually everything uh, uh, on the system, and it worked surprisingly well. It, it surprised me how well it worked. 
mainly because the people were dedicated software craftsmen and were willing to pair and we were willing to write tests and we were constantly reviewing the code that we were writing. And uh, okay, Jack here, I've seen uh, some pretty spectacular failures uh, because of this, uh, because of geographic problems, but even worse, the temporal, uh, temporally dis dispersed teams where you're 12 hours away from mm -hmm. someone else. So what happens is I, it can still be very effective. I mean, it's still possible. And Code Collaborator, for example, I've seen used uh, with teams scattered around the world very well. Uh, but it will be, always be less efficient than uh, having people that are at least more or less in the same time zone because, you know, half the team is asleep um, half the time. And uh, you just can't get their can't get their attention, and I think uh, I think ultimately, if you take all the discussion we've had in the last hour or so, it, most of this is going to come down to tr the true professionalism of the uh, members of the team, and uh, the the teams I see with the biggest failures are the ones who just do not act professionally, and those who are truly devoted to the profession and behave. Uh, you know, engage this in the, the highest possible way, tend to make things work no matter what the, these sorts of challenges are. Okay. Hey, uh, just one last line. This is Jared. When people are distributed, um, Andy Hunt always likes to say that the email, the bandwidth in email is low. I don't know if that quote originated with him, but I've heard him say it enough. I sort of stick his name on it now. When you're trying to figure out if somebody is mad at you. I mean, think of how many times we've had arguments over email, right? Somebody's email something, you get mad, and it just escalates. Don't use any tool as your last line of defense. You know, get a video camera up, especially if someone's remote, to discuss what came out of the tool, right? If you're using Code Collaborator, start there, but don't stop there. Use it as a way to engage the other team members in conversations. That's the best way to to move past the you know the cold gray ASCII of the screen and actually engage a teammate. Okay. Looks like a good place to end off. Thank you. I want to say thank you very much to all of our panelists who, as I said, I think this could be at least two hours worth of beer in this uh, our, our virtual bar room here at the conference. Um, we will be coming back to these topics in upcoming webinars. Uh, I'm glad that just about all of you hung out with us the whole time. So I think that it, it, there's plenty of stuff to talk about more. Um, I encourage you to obviously check out Code Collaborator, also to check out Software Quality Connection. Um, and we will do our best to let you know about a uh, recording of the webinar, as well as follow-ups for the questions that we didn't get to, because they were many. Thank you very, very much for participating. and. Have a good day. Thanks, folks. It was a lot of fun. Thank you.